I'd like to start by thanking FIP guard Baltasar Dolores Maria for having invited me to come here. I also would like to greet the, uh, the other panelists. We, all, we are all South Americans, uh, aren't we? I also would like to thank Javier Chavi, director of FIC Car in Colombia, because she gave me lots of input for me to share with you. And well, let me tell you that contrary to everyone that has taken part in this roundtable, I'm not an expert on universal jurisdiction or human rights. I am an expert, actually, in civil uh, civil accountability. And then, well, my career or my work that I conducted within the Constitutional Courts of Colombia gave me expertise and experience, but I would never classify myself as an expert. Well, I've been asked to, well, I've been given 15 minutes. And I said to myself, what should I do? Shall I share only? two ideas, or perhaps I would just share very briefly 48 ideas. So I think I would take approach number two. That is to say, I will share a number of ideas with you. First one being that it is obvious to say that universal jurisdiction is based on two pillars. The first one being fight against humanity and then guarantee of the rights of the victims. But after hearing the other speakers, of the previous speakers, I can feel that actually that the approach that is being given to universal jurisdiction is under the magnifying lenses or the lenses of criminal law. So I think this is a reflection that shall be made upon because that favors impunity. So that is one of the main fundaments of the universal jurisdiction. All right, OK, I will take off my scarf. I was saying that the first general reflection is that, yes, we should also take a look at universal jurisdiction, not only from criminal law, but from civil accountability. Be very careful. The other justification for universal jurisdiction is reparation offered to victims. And I think that that topic has not, has not virtually been touched upon. What happens with reparation? How can we offer reparation to the victims? And for that, I would like to mention that the objective will be to what extent universal jurisdiction can ensure or not reparation to the for the victims. And that was the need, the title of this panel or this round table. So for that objective, I will develop two parts. So first of all, the twofold way to protect victims of universal jurisdiction, and then second, to take a look at the rules that will be suitable in order to offer effective protection to victims. I will not focus on the issue of uh, punishment or impun impunity. I leave that up to criminal experts. The first part regarding protection of victims and the universal jurisdiction, I uh, will divide it in the first part that has been already been touched upon here, which is the acceptance of universal jurisdiction by states, whether there is an actual protection for victims in cases of universal jurisdiction in national states. And first, I'd like to say on this point that there is uh, insufficient protection in the cases that have been prosecuted before. My colleague uh, Guillermo or William has uh, talked about successful cases, but allowed me to disagree with the success of those cases from the viewpoint of uh, reparation of victims. Rwanda case, when Belgium uh, condemned the perpetrator, the compensation was only economical. 
However, the compensation was not given to the victims because the accused did not have any goods or property in Belgium, and then the properties had been seized. So the victim did not repair any, did not receive any reparation. I don't want to mean that reparation is only economic, uh, economical one. Belgium, the shared president, had had been subjected to penal proceedings in uh, Senegal. He was arrested in 2002 and 2005. Well, now the process is moving slowly. France, Eli Oludal, violation of uh, human rights in Mauritania. It was found that the investigator or the accused did not have any goods to be used for the repaired. Then the victims received some uh, compensation from a reparation found that is in, in place in France. So the same could be said for Justice Carson. Well, some compensation or some reparation was offered, but just out of coincidence, just because 9 million euros were found in some bank accounts. So let us say that the system is not ready uh, to offer actual reparation to victims. Second thing that I'd like to ask myself is the following. What are the hindrances? What are the hindrances to protect, to offer protection to victims? Accepting universal jurisdiction in a national state does not necessarily imply protecting the victim. First hindrance, friends barrier. Well, each country have different reparation rules, rules for reparation. So it depends whether the person is arrested. There is a difference between the person being arrested in Colombia or Ecuador or in the US or Mauritania. Therefore, here we are facing a first problem, that is to say inequality of the rules in every country regarding the minimum standards. And now I'd like to give you an example, a recent book about he is quoting the title of the book in French, Full Preparations of Victims, where a number of deep disagreements are presented between the different national jurisdictions. First of all, about the scope of the reparation. Can it be limited through administrative reparation? So sometimes some limitation is being set on the number that and the money that is given to the family. Is this principle of repair has constitutional value or it is conventional depending on the country or can be limited by the lawmaker? Like in many cases, for instance, if you kill yourself in a plane accident, then, well, you may be, your relatives may be getting some money or not, according to some international treatment. So these are some of the hindrances that are multiple in number because comprehensive reparation is different from country to country. Many countries give priority to economical reparation and non economical reparation is limited. On the other hand, equity, equity that plays a significant role, especially in international court. It will, this amount of money will be given in, in equity. So is the damage the measure to calculate or to work out the compensation or not? So that concept of equity could be interpreted subjectively and could create, could be the cause for differences in different countries. And the same goes for punishable <coughs> punitive damages. The Anglo-Saxon system <coughs> accepts these uh, sanctions of punitive uh, damages. Well, this is a situation in Europe, but the situation is similar in Latin America. But let us say that 
Latin America or Colombia is very much advanced in these topics. But some countries have no idea whatsoever. Mexico, they have just removed a constitutional prohibition that pro prohibited to bring cases or bring charges against the state. Therefore, those topics lead us to another topic. So imagine that you've been lucky enough to come from a state that has optimal rules for reparation. However, you will find lots of problems depending on the jurisdiction that is applicable to you. For instance, I'm talking about Colombia. Well, criminal judges are not aware about the theory on damage. We have to teach the criminal uh, lawyers, uh, we have to teach them about uh, damages and about uh, lost profits. You know, compensation is not only pecuniary compensation, but it is also sometimes pe com pe pecuniary. And then, well, money also dignifies you. Let me tell you, well, when we are talking about the human uh, rights research, no, no, we are not going to talk about money, guarantee for no repetition. Oh, come on, if we are talking about a widow, a widow prefers 500,000 euros to 2,000 euros, because if she's got 500,000 euros, she can buy herself a home to dignify her life and her future. This is not happening under universal jurisdiction. If that happens, well, I don't even want. Well, that is the case in the in countries that I'm aware of that I know, but I couldn't really imagine what would be the case in the countries that I'm not that I don't know. With this, I refer to African countries or to um, Asian countries. We also have procedural shortages. Some countries do not have class actions. They are essential in Colombia. The great cases for human rights are being led by class actions. And that does not exist in many countries. And from the practical viewpoint in these cases, there are also barriers. Victims that are living in different countries, in a different country, do not have access to the information about their case. They do not have access to the record. Sometimes they do not have the money to appear before the courts in their countries. So there are a number of shortages. There are a number of hindrances, hindrances that have not been overcome by the ICC. And again, I go back to Tomas Lubanga case. Well, no great reparation was given to the victim, and then these a man or this perpetrator was not even uh, condemned for these sexual crimes that he had also committed. So what can we do? What can we do? From the viewpoint of civil accountability, there is a remarkable shortage, a great shortage in terms of uh, repair, reparation. First of all, we have to see or take a look at the input given by some courts. But yes, this is so, but that is for the states. That's a different jurisdiction. I don't know whether that is universal jurisdiction or not. European court, is that universal jurisdiction? Oh, no, it is a European court or an inter-American court. There have been significant developments stating or talking about the different ways of reparation. But we have to recur to the soft law, that the soft law, and uh, we'd like them to become international national treaties, and we would like them to gain impetus and to become more and more stronger. stronger. And we also need resolutions, of course. Well, 5683 from 2001, that resolution, it is little known in human rights. Crawford Resolution on Cambridge was the last drafter where he talks about the following general principles, and that is also implemented up applied to human rights. 
Well, the states have to offer guarantees for no repetition. In terms of reparation, says that the restitution restitution in natura, that is to say, to give back to the victim or to put the victim in the state where she was before the damage. Second, money, economical compensation. And third, satisfaction. Satisfaction meaning recognition of violation, formal excuse, or any form of satisfaction. So when we talk about reparation, development has been made primarily on the issues of satisfaction. I would also would like to mention 40, Resolution 4044 from 1985, as well as Resolution 6147 from 2005, very important in human rights. It's a bit uh, confusing. It's a bit misleading. It talks about lost profit. So in terms of universal jurisdiction, we should ask universal jurisdiction to have like clearer conceptually speaking resolutions. So here they talk about access to justice, reparation f from damages, again, restitution, rehabilitation and guarantee of non-repetition. So here we can see that there are some general principles that could be very helpful for the development of universal jurisdiction. And here, two ideas. Universal jurisdiction has two types of victims. First of, first of all, the flesh one, you know, the person who has been killed, raped, whatever. But then the international community. And I think that the tendency that has been in terms of case law has been protecting the international community whilst uh, neglecting or whilst not paying attention so much to the actual, to the physical person. Sometimes, well, the victim is legitimized as a unique and universal entity, in so much as Dante said, those who are aware of pain know it all. Or as Jungen said, pain is one of those keys that help us open the doors, no, not that much to our internal uh, inside, but to the world. It is clear that the tendency of universal jurisdiction has been more efficient with the universal victim in the international community than with the direct victim of the damages. In that case, universal jurisdiction should make as equal as possible the two levels of victims and should defend and should take, put, give greater attention to the physical victim. Therefore, lots of efforts have to be made in terms of international funds that should be created for compensation, as it was the case in the United Nations whenever when Iraq invaded Kuwait. So there was uh, an action class, a class action, followed by five million people. It was not a minor event, it was a major event. And also, I also would like to insist we don't really have to give great preference or, 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 or importance to economical reparation. Money also dignifies. Also, money money also dignifies you. It is obvious, we all know it, but for some reason, well, this issue is not further developed. I think I've gone over my time. Yes, time is over. I would like to finish up by saying that what is most important when it comes to reparation is the victim. No, even if we have collective victims, the central axis for a correct system of reparation must be the individual victim. And of course, inserts it within a collectivity and a group. And here we have the discussion where does the group or the collective start and when does the individualism stop. So, but I must say, I'd like to say that this person is inserted within the group, within the collectivity. As Paul Valéry would say, the deepest thing of man is the skin, and the skin is a quality of the human being.
We have this question for Dr. Enal. There are many questions, actually. We cannot take them all. And uh, the same as the chairperson from the previous panel, I will refer these questions to the organization so they use any of the media available, the internet or any communication, modern media can be used to have them all answered. So, since I've been told that I have to have to, to finish by 14.45, unfortunately, we will not take them all. Dr. Hena, we have one here which I find it is very important. In a proceeding with universal jurisdiction, you mention reparation for victims. Yeah, that's just a comment. First question then. So, reparation by criminals that caused the damage? The handwriting series, I cannot understand it. I don't know if it's a lawyer or a doctor writing down because the handwriting is terrible. Take it from their assets and if they have state representatives, maybe make reparations come from public heritage then? Or public treasury? So, okay, so taxpayers' money? So you mean that if this, is it up to the state to pay the reparation? And, and if so, they will be using the tax uh, money? to pay for, for the victim. So this is a tricky question, undoubtedly. This is a tricky question. Uh, well, because violations of human rights, violations of human rights are uh, are for the state to, to be accountable for. And so it is the state that needs to take responsibility because they, they are indictable to the state. Thank you very much for your question. I think it's a matter of in indictment and allocation of damage, who it is attributed to. It is about attribution, allocation. So the one who is considered accountable for the damage is the one who has to pay. There are many excuses. There are very nice legal terms which explain it is about enforceability of all symbolic reparation measures. Wonderful legal terms. So, excuses for the massacre, slaughtering of kids in Guatemala. Well, then you place a memorial here saying uh, 100 kids were killed here. And if the president doesn't want, how do you do that? Well, this is an interesting topic, enforceability. But it, uh, well, I would talk about enforceability, enforceability of obligations without, without pecuniary Dam uh, damage. Uh, this is common in human rights because then we were talking about pecuniary subrogate where you pay with money and it seems, in principle, it seems it's easier. Although we've seen that in universal jurisdiction this is not usually the case. But who is to be held accountable for crimes? Well, criminals, of course, but that's first. But as we've seen, 90% of cases uh, of universal jurisdiction, criminals, so at Chevron, Texan, they, they, they go into bankruptcy, they don't have money, they, they do not disclose their bank secrets. And so it is difficult for criminals to prove to, they, to have funds. So there are two ways around this. As my colleague Luis Miguel said, we, we need to be dreamers. In 68 it was said, Let's dream of the impossible. What's impossible? Well, start conceptually for a point where the victim is secondary to international um, crime. And, and that is the international community secondary to international crime. So, in the light of this, states need to create a fund to contribute to victims' reparation because they are also victims but they also need to be shown solidarity with other states' victims. 
And I think it has to do with a fund by the ICC or a fund uh, governed by any other institution. This way, we prevent having them take the money from taxpayers because those good citizens that have not broken the law are the ones paying. That's true. So anywhere in the world, whenever, wherever, there, there are liabilities where the state is culprit that comes from the treasury and the treasury gets the money from taxpayers and that's where the money for reparations comes from but that's not negative it is just about humankind solidarity and it's about the individual and the community